Here we go. Okay, so we are recording and we are ready to go with um, Stina and Benjamin. Take it away. Were you going to give the uh, intro? Section? Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. I mean, actually, you know what? I'm going to let you guys do that. You are pros at, at this topic. And uh, here, hold on. Let me, let's see. <laughs> Um, yeah, sorry, y'all. We are, we've had some Zoom issues today, so we are working on it. Um, let's see. So this is um, Discovering the Visionary Poetry of Edith Sodergran. It's a journey through her life and work. This year marks the 100th anniversary of the death of one of Finland's greatest poets. Age 31, when she passed away in an isolated Karelian village near her native St. Petersburg, Sodergran had only published four slim volumes of poetry and was largely unknown to the wider public. No one then could have imagined that she would be one day one of the most loved beloved poets Finland has produced, influencing new generations of poets and appreciated by readers all over the world. And we have, um, as I said, we have Benjamin and Stina joining us today. Um, they are, hold on, wonderful. Hold on, I'm just trying to pull up all of your information. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to let them go ahead and talk through Edith and um, we'll have some really great learnings from this session. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Um, so I'll go ahead and start, and I'm going to give a brief introduction uh, to Edith Sodegran. Um, so yeah, my name is Benjamin uh, Mir Cruz, and I'm an assistant professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I'm in the departments of Gender and Women's Studies and also uh, German, Nordic, and Slavic, um, where I focus on Swedish literature and film, uh, trans queer cinema, and I do translation as well as Stina does that. And I also look uh, at documentary filmmaking and uh, uh, how documentary filmmakers in Sweden, um, yeah, uh, film, um, create representations of the self. Um, so yeah, so I'll go ahead and give a brief introduction to Stina, who we'll hear from after my introduction. So uh, she is, Stina Kachadorian is an author, journalist, and literary translator. She was born in Helsinki, Finland, but she now lives at Stanford University, California. Uh, she holds degrees from Helsinki University and also Stanford University. Uh, she's published several prize-winning books of literary translations of Swedish and Finnish poets. Of course, she has translated uh, beautifully, gorgeously translated uh, Edith Sodegrand's poetry into English. Uh, so I'll say a little bit more about that. Um, so for now, I have a brief uh, share my screen here. Moment. We have our presentation. So yeah, um, so here we have Edith Sodegran. Um, hopefully, most of you have read her poetry. Um, I've had I've taught Edith Sodegran's poetry in several courses, and students have just fallen in love with her work. Um, reading her work basically changed like the course of my career. Um, I used to study German, I read her poetry, which I should say I read first the bilingual trans uh, translation that Stina uh, translated, and I didn't know Swedish at the time. I saw the Swedish and it looked just so beautiful. I'm like, I want to learn that language, but it was Stina's translations that made me really try to learn Swedish and then it changed. I went from German to uh, studying Finland Swedish literature and Swedish. Yeah, so it's the power of translation and Stina's work. So thank you for that. So yeah, a brief intro to Edith Sudegran. Uh, she is a Finland Swedish modernist poet uh, who was born in 1892 and died quite young in 1923. She was an influential literary force in the development of Finland's modern literature. We have a younger photo of her. She was proficient in several languages, um, but she ended up writing her poetry, publishing her poetry in Swedish, very innovative Swedish language poetry, Finland Swedish language poetry that was irregular. It was non-rhyming verse that was unconstrained by conventional lyrical expression. Her groundbreaking poetry has cemented her status as one of the earliest producers of literary modernism in the Nordic countries. Influenced by German expressionism, French symbolism, and Russian futurism, 
Sudegdan's poetry was a bold literary intervention in a traditionally male dominated profession. And that's something that we should probably keep in mind as we're discussing and learning about Sudegdan today is that uh, she was uh, paving a way for um, um, a lot of authors at the time. Here is an example of her poetry for any of us who haven't uh, uh, read her poetry. I won't read it. This is Stina's um, gorgeous translation, but we can see in this very short poem uh, that there is like, there's no rhyme and it's very simple, but it is it, it is it's expansive and it's just gorgeous. Um, I this. I, I'll briefly read it. Um, Astina might uh, return to this poem later. Um, so on foot, I had to walk through the solar systems before I found the first thread of my red dress. Already I sense myself. Somewhere in space hangs my heart. Sparks fly from it, shaking the air to other reckless hearts. Uh, yeah, just wow. This is uh, someone writing 19, well, in the mid, uh, 1916 through 1923, um, only a few lines, but groundbreaking. So here is an example of her first, uh, some images of her first uh, piece, her debut work, Dikta, uh, which is translated into poems. This is from, as I just mentioned, 1916. Uh, here we have in the lower right-hand cor corner, a, a, a photograph of the first edition of Dicta, which I don't have, but I'm sure Stina has, I'm quite jealous of that. Um, and then he, um, where um, the text I have here, this is from the manuscript, so the Grand's manuscript, um, where she wrote in her, yeah, uh, and we, there, all of this is digitalized with the manuscripts um, at the Svenska Literaturselskapet i Finland uh, online. And so here's just an example of her handwriting. And so her initial, her debut, it incited a passionate, passionate responses from literary critics that effectively led to the advent of modernism in Finland's literature. The audacity that her poems uh, had by, you know, not rhyming and some of the imagery that was contained, um, she was heavily, heavily criticized. But of course, that brought much attention to her work. Sudegran made bold public calls for new art forms. Her modernist manifesto, Individuell Kunst, uh, published in the Swedish language newspaper Dagens Press, uh, upon the release of her second poetry collection, The September Liar, September Lyran, from 1918, called for a transfiguration of literature that would usher in a new wave of art created by the individual. And so here is just a, a an example of some of the things she said in this manifesto. She wrote, translated, I urge individuals to work only for immortality, a false expression, to develop themselves to the highest degree, to put themselves in the service of the future. The manifesto was the first European avant-garde manifesto written by a woman making Södergran's efforts all the more unique to the literary landscapes of early 20th century Europe. And my colleague Ursula Lindqvist um, has written an article on uh, Södergran's avant-garde manifesto and the impact that is made in Finnish uh, and Swedish language literature. Here is also examples of uh, all of the first editions, again, that I don't have, but Stina probably has, um, of her work. And uh, as Aline mentioned, um, she didn't have a, a large literary output because her writing career was so short, unfortunately, uh, due to her early death um, when she was, after she had been diagnosed with tuberculosis. So yeah, she has become one of Finland's most widely read authors, despite the fact that she produced relatively little. Uh, poems, uh, Dikta from 1916 uh, was her debut. Then we have what I have the aforementioned, the September Liar, uh, uh, September Lyran from 1918. Then we have um, The Rose Altar from 1919, and then Shadow of the Future, 1920. Then we have two aphorism collections, Motley Observations, and uh, Thoughts of Nature. Her final collection, uh, Landa Semike, The Land That Is Not, was published posthumously in, uh, in 1925. And 
uh, yeah, her posthumous collection is uh, quite different from some of her earlier work, um, but very much similar um, with the nature imagery that uh, is contained in her work. An example of some translations here we have, we have editions of Stina's work, again, that, that changed my life. And um, so here is just a, another example of Sudegran's bold um, writing style. So she writes in translation, my self-confidence comes from the fact that I have discovered my own dimensions. It does not behoove me to make myself smaller than I am. Sudegran has inspired creative adaptations of her poetry across various media, including theater, music, television, and art. Uh, I've, I've read manuscripts of the play that uh, was produced about her life and poetry. There's music from folk music to vocal music to um, really catchy pop music, uh, even very contemporary pop music that uh, is made to her. Mm. That they've adapted to her work. Um, Mali Sanden, for example, uh, a Swedish singer, has um, sung some of her poems. Uh, television, I believe in the 70s, there was like a, a short dramatic piece about her life and work, and then uh, many art pieces. And as the most significant player in the development of, of Finland's literary modernism, Sodegran has been translated into several languages, including multiple English translations. And I cannot recommend these uh, by uh, Stina uh, I, enough. They're just beautiful. And we have here Love and Solitude, which I'm sure uh, Stina can uh, talk about later uh, when I'm through. And then an updated version, Love, Solitude, and the Face of Death, um, with um, some newer poems, or newly translated poems, of course. Edith Sudegran, oh, my text is, sorry. Can't see my own text, here we go. So the Grand emerged as one of Finland's most renowned authors in spite of her personal struggles with terminal illness, complex connection to a national identity and various bouts of poverty. Yet as a female author writing at a time when it was still common for women to publish under male pseudonyms, so the Grand struggled and still struggles after her death to be read independent of a mythologized bi biography and several uh, critics and colleagues, um, Estina, um, um, have written about this. So Degran's earliest poetry was written between January 1907 and the summer of 1909 in an oilcloth notebook referred to as the Wachstuchsheftet, and it comprises 242 poems, mostly in German. Some are in French, some, uh, several are in French, um, a couple are in Russian. Uh, there's also English uh, poetry there and Finnish as well. And here is an example of some German poetry. Composed years before her first publication, this collection has been historically regarded as a diary confessions of a young schoolgirl. Therefore, several of her complex poems have been overlooked, mostly overlooked. The major majority of the poems are informed by themes of nature and love, whereas their style is influenced by the poetry of Goethe and especially Heinrich Heine. Um, yeah, I, I also read German, so I was able to analyze some of these and I think they can be, they're very, complex and they quite deep. Uh, so yeah, it is a shame that some of this was um, historically overlooked hmm. or more considered about like um, uh, her biography, as I mentioned. Her early poetry featured themes of, we see in the title of Stina's uh, translations, uh, nature, alienation, love, and confinement. Um, as we know that she was quite ill, um, <clears throat> Sudegran's debut poems is rich with symbolism and explores womanhood, sexuality, existentialism, and eroticism, all of which are intimately interwoven with images of nature. And so here is another example from her manuscript, and this is a poem, um, I Saw a Tree, another poem that Astina has translated. Um, yeah, and here's just an example of Sudegran's uh, uh, written uh, poem here. And another example of uh, her poetry here, we just, <laughs> this one I, um, 
is just a set, uh, an example of how short her poems were, but also how expansive they were. And we can see, even if we don't um, uh, speak Swedish, that um, it's just maybe a different style than what we might be seeing, used to. She, she was, as I mentioned, quite impact, influential. And here I have examples of some of her colleagues that supported her. I mentioned earlier that her work was heavily criticized uh, by literary critics and other authors at the time uh, for her just the audacity of her work. Uh, but she had some, uh, some people who were championing her work. Two of them were Hage Olsen. Um, this is um, in the top. Right, and that was a. This is a photograph uh, by taken by Sodegran. Sodegran um, was very um, much into photography, and there's collections of her uh, photography that have been published. And then we have Elma Dektonias, and uh, these are both Finland Swedish authors. And this was also a photograph taken by Edik Sodegran. And these three um, championed uh, Finland Swedish modernism or this avant garde spirit in journals and in translations. And I wanted to end my brief introduction uh, with um, some comments that Haga Olsen um, said about Sudegran. She said it better than I ever could. So uh, commenting on Edith Sudegran, again, this is in translation. Haga Olsen, another influential uh, Finland Swedish writer said, no one had heard anything like this before. Here was the consciousness of modern humanity suddenly exploding into Finland's provincial cultural milieu which despite world war and civil war was still completely anchored in the past and imagined that it still retained unchallenged possession of its territory. <laughs> it is both tragic and comic to remember how totally incapable readers were of understanding such language at the time. Here was a poet who took it for granted that she was partly responsible for future development of the human race, but who saw her poems not as evidence of personal talent, in this respect, like most great artists, Edith Sodegran was humble. But as an independent spiritual phenomenon, some, something which grew and became reality in her subconscious, a gift she had received from the gods and was fortunate to be able to pass on. So there we have it from Haga Olsen, a little bit about the impact of Sodegran's work. Um, so that is my brief introduction to the life and work of Edith Sodegran. And so now, uh, we would uh, love to, I would love to pass this on to Stina so that she could share her. Um, yeah. Well, Benjamin, thank you so much for that generous introduction and uh, your generous comments about my translations. It's great to be part of this FinFest with my morning cup of coffee here in California. And uh, um, I think Sedegran would have loved it too. She was all about reaching out and com connecting with people and kindred souls. And uh, it's fun to imagine what she would have done if she had had access to the internet in Raivola. <laughs> I think she would have been uh, emailing right and left and probably Zooming and uh, loved Google and perhaps even Facebook uh, because she was someone who was really curious. She wanted her words to be out there and she, she needed and she craved, uh, in fact, a connection and contact. Uh, she was open to things that were new. She was unconventional. She went to great lengths to uh, reach out and explore others and herself. And uh, so much so that she could write the poem that Benjamin actually cited already on foot. I had to walk through the solar systems. And I'll just read it once more because it's, it's short. On foot, I had to walk through the solar systems before I found the first thread of my red dress. Already I sense myself. Somewhere in space hangs my heart. Sparks fly from it, shaking the air to other reckless hearts. Yeah, sparks were flying from her heart. And although it's now been a hundred years since she died, they still do. 
Uh, many of the poems, poets who were writing at the time that she was alive are no longer being read. But Peseda Grand continues to be read and continues to appear in new editions and translations for generations of, of very different kinds of readers. So even if you're new to poetry, and some of you may be, I would urge you to um, try reading her. And I can almost guarantee that you'll find one or two or three poems that really strike a chord with you, make you understand why this woman who was mostly writing from a re remote corner of Finland uh, continues to win new readers from all over the world. Of course, this cannot happen without one thing, and that is translation. So as a translator, I'm going to spend most of my time uh, talking about Sira Gran and her languages, um, about her own interest in translation, then talk a little bit about the history of uh, her being translated, particularly into Finnish and English. And finally, a little bit about my own story of translating her. And Benjamin, you're right. I did have those early editions of Sedagran in my possession, but I gave them away last year. I thought they were going to be, they should be back in Finland. And so they're now in the position of someone I'm sure you know, Frederick Herzberg, who also does wonderful work on Sedagran. So oh, no. <laughs> they're back then. Um, but of course, she wasn't just from a remote corner of Finland. She was born in St. Petersburg. And Petersburg at the time was a teeming multicultural city, with, uh, which was the fourth largest city of Europe at the time. It was, you know, after Berlin and Paris and London, St. Petersburg was right up there. It had about a hundred, uh, one and uh, 1.4 million people when she was born and growing rapidly in those first two centuries, uh, first de decades of, of, of the century. And there were many, many subcultures. There was a Finnish subculture, there was a Swedish subculture, and a Finland-Swedish subculture with their own churches and community organizations and so on. The Serda Grants belonged to um, a Finland Swedish church, et cetera, et cetera. And as you know, there had been uh, Finns living in St. Petersburg for three, four generations already. Uh, uh, as you may know, some of the workers in the famous uh, Fabergé uh, uh, jewelry business were Finnish craftsmen and artists and so on and so forth. Sedergrand's parents were solidly middle-class uh, Finland Swedes. Her mother, actually Helena, had been born in St. Petersburg. So she was really uh, through and through a St. Petersburgian at the time. And uh, although they could have enrolled Edith in a uh, Finland Swedish or Swedish school, they chose to enroll her in a very famous school in St. Petersburg called the Petri Schule. It has a longer, more complicated name, but that's what it's known by. And uh, it was an excellent school. Uh, she took several languages there. She was a very gifted li linguist um, who could easily switch between Finnish, Swedish, German, Russian, uh, English um, and French. She actually had a serious crush on her French teacher, whose name has gone to history only because of that, I think. <laughs> but she, so her home language was Swedish, but she claimed later on in her life that her best language really was German still. And uh, there are ways in which you can see this in, in her writings. Uh, she felt that in terms of grammar and correct grammar, she was on 
the surest footing when she was writing in German. But of course, poetry is a different story. It gives you more leeway and more freedom. So in some ways, uh, um, it, it, it maybe helped her to, to write in Swedish. Um, it's a mystery somewhat why she switched from her early schoolgirl poetry into writing in uh, Swedish. We don't quite understand. Maybe you, Benjamin, have some theories about that. But that's what she did. And her own um, interest in translation actually comes much later in her life. It comes when she was um, already quite ill, living in Raibola, where she and her mother had moved as a result of the Russian Revolution where they also lost all their money, so they became quite quite poor. And the uh, um, Swedish-Finnish Authors Association had, under the guise of trying to help her financially, given her a sum of money um, for her to live on, basically. And she had chosen, Edith had chosen, to use this to bring out a volume of translations into German. She had contacted a couple of different um, publishers, and they were initially interested. There was a long correspondence about this. Elma Dictonius, the poet, was quite involved in this too. But finally, it all came to naught. And it really took a lot of her strength away in those last few years to, to have been working on this. But this is what she was. She was a passionate person who wanted to reach out, who wanted to make connection. And this was part of her efforts of making, making connections. Um, so uh, Sira Gran herself has been translated into roughly 30 languages. I think Benjamin mentioned this. Um, and there are, of course, the big ones, French, German, Spanish, Italian, um, uh, English, and then smaller ones like Dutch and Norwegian, Danish, um, and, and then some really exotic ones like Khmer. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing it right, but, um, and also Esperanto, for example. Um, unfortunately, there is not much time to, to go into these, and I would refer you to Agneta Rahikainen's excellent article about her being translated into other languages, which is called in Swedish, Et mot på beremmelse, Edith Södergran i översättning, which I would translate one measure of success, Edith Södergran in translation, if you want to know more. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the translations into Finnish first. Rahikainen says that Finnish was the first language into which an individual Södergran poem was translated, closely followed actually, interestingly, by Estonia. Um, um, as early as the year of her death in 1923, there were poems translated into Finnish. Um, and these were by the poet Uno Kailas um, and other translators, major ones into Finnish have been Ale Tynni and later uh, and very successfully, I would say, Penti Saritsa. Her collected poems, though, were published in Finnish as late as 1994. And that's later than, than into English. Uh, uh, for example, uh, by Saritsa, who was the uh, editor of that collection. And um, uh, it, the title is Elemani, Olemani, Kohtaloni. And Saritsa says in his introduction that perhaps the reason that it took so long for her to be translated into Finnish was that a lot of her readers actually could read Swedish, so they read her in the, in the original. Um, 
one interesting comment that Rahikainen makes about translations into Finnish is that it is a much more flexible language than Swedish. You can change the word order in Finnish quite a bit and still not lose the meaning, which you can't do in Swedish, really. And I'd like to give you an example of the first three lines of her first poem in the first collection that Benjamin referred to, Jag såg ett träd, that um, in Swedish reads, Jag såg ett träd som var högre än alla andra. I saw a tree that was taller than all the rest. And Kailas has in Finnish, Mina näin puun kaikkia muita suuremman. And Ale Tynni has, Mina näin puun, joka oli suurempi kaikkia muita. And Saritsa has, Mina näin puun, joka oli kaikkia muita suurempi. Now you try to scramble that word order in Swedish and it doesn't make any sense. It's interesting to me actually that, that they all chose surempi instead of korkeampi. But who am I to question them? Um, so finally, a few words about translations into English. As I mentioned, Sedega was pretty fluent in English. Um, and was able to read, for example, Walt Whitman in the original. Uh, uh, I've looked at a very charming travel diary that she kept when she and her mother traveled to Europe and to Davos, where she was being treated for TB. And it's in English. And uh, it's part of the archives of the Svenska Literaturselskap at the Swedish Literary Society in Helsinki. And it's a pretty supple English. She crosses out some misspelled words and, and, and you know, corrects them, which would tell me that she probably had a little traveling dictionary too with her. And it's full of lively descriptions of what she saw uh, including one which I love, which she wrote in English when she and her mother had traveled to Italy and she was up high on some place looking over the Mediterranean Sea and she was so excited about this beautiful vista and she puts it down in English. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, so English is, a trans is the language, as Rahikainen points out, that has attracted most numbers of translators. Uh, she's appeared in English both in large anthologies in major by major publishers, which is a wonderful way to uh, get her out into the world, as well as in many uh, selected poems from small presses. The latest selections that I am aware of, uh, there's one by Malena Merling and Jonas Ellerström from 2012. And then there is the one that you saw uh, by me, which is from 2017. Um, the earliest is an anthology by Sid Erik Talkvist from 1947. Martin Orwood published a collection, collected, poem, uh, collected poems in 1980. And the British translator David Macduff, a complete poems in 1984. And there are many, many more. And again, I can refer you back to Rahikainen's article if you're interested. Uh, my first collection of Serda Grand translations is entitled Love and Solitude and was published in 1981, followed by an enlarged bilingual edition, or two of them in 85 and 92. And those were the ones I think that Benjamin referred to. The latest, unfortunately not a bilingual edition, and I'll tell you why I say unfortunately, is from 
17 and is entitled Love, Solitude and the Face of Death. Um, I've also written a play about her, which was performed here at Stanford uh, by the student drama group and then was picked up by a um, um, Finland Swedish small theater company who managed to take it around to several places, including the Dramaten in, in, in Stockholm, actually, at one point, and Lilla Teatan in Helsinki, for, in Helsinki. It was adapted into a television uh, play, uh, which was Finland's representative at one point at the television festival in Banff in Canada. Um, and just another example of how she is spreading, as Benjamin referred to, uh, I've also been asked many times by composers to for permission to use my translations in compositions, uh, song cycles, and even an opera, which is presumably under uh, being being composed in Denmark. Um, the latest is a women's choral group in New York that sang some set some of her songs to music um, poems to music. And the composer Kaya Saria, who has done a song cycle set to Södergran poems. So she has found many ways to march out into the world. And um, I think I would like to stop here and um, see where we go next. <laughs> Hi everyone. Um, thank you, Stina and Benjamin so much. That was really interesting. And um, I learned so much about her. Um, if anyone has any questions for Stina and Benjamin, um, feel free to put them in the Q&A at the bottom of the screen. Um, and we can answer them uh, as they come in. Um, and uh, you can also chat to us as well. So please let us know if you have any questions from uh, for these amazing panelists. Let's see. Um, Heather wants to know what her most famous poem is. So maybe in Finland and then also in some of the other languages that she's written. Well, I was thinking, um, you, you, would you, would you, would you have one, Benjamin? I was thinking I would read a couple of, 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 the ones that yeah that would be amazing thank you yeah, please okay so um since she is such a many faceted poet and has a very different voice in different stages of her production i i thought i would read one early poem and then maybe a couple of later poems um um, I know that Benjamin has worked on her um, sense of herself uh, in terms of her gender. And I'd love to hear a little bit more about that. And that is why I'm reading one that speaks to that called The Arch Modern. I'll read it only in English just to save time. Um, but she says, I am no woman. I am a neuter. I am a child, a page boy, and a bold decision. I am a laughing streak of scarlet sun. I am a net for all voracious fish. I am a toast to every woman's honor. I'm a step toward chance and toward ruin. I'm a leap in freedom and the self. I'm the whisper of desire in a man's ear. I'm the soul's shivering, the flesh's longing and denial. I'm an entry sign to new paradises. I'm a flame searching and brave. I am water, deep yet bold up to the knees. I'm fire and water, honestly combined on free terms. Would you like to comment on this, uh, Benjamin, a little bit? Yeah, that's, oh, 
just hearing you hearing you recite it is just is beautiful. Um, this this poem, the the Fierge Moderne, uh, would mean like the modern virgin um, from the French title. Uh, we hear, as Sina just read, she makes so many declarations, bold declarations of who she is, um, and very very proud of who she is and her uh, her womanhood, her femininity. But also, she makes these declarations of these contradictions that exist within her. And so I think just like her poetry, which was unrestrained um, from conventions, she speaks about herself um, as someone who also is not constrained by um, typical uh, patriarchal hegemonic um, conceptions of gender, that this binary, we see, we see that she's playing with binaries here. And so um, even though, uh, May, we might not have been using the terminology back then, but I, I wrote an, I've written an article about her gender queer expression, that it was very much a celebration of womanhood, but it was also a celebration of being someone who transcended gender or modern conceptions of it. And we see with her opening lines that she is not a woman, she's a neuter. And so she's uh, giving voice to the expansiveness that gender can be and, um, and she does it in very illuminating ways with these contradictions. And then she, she's sharing with us that she thrives in these paradoxes and contradictions, just um, as we can thrive if we don't limit ourselves to, to these um, arbitrary um, distinctions and categories. Sorry, Alex. That's wonderful, thank you. Um, Stina, we have another question for you. Yeah. Um, how do you decide whether you would like your translation to be used by a composer? And are there approaches that you would be more or less excited about? Well, the way it typically happens is that somebody contacts me and says, may I use this um, uh, for such and such? And um, I almost always obviously say yes. And <laughs> that's the end of my control over that. Um, it is just um, um, always a, um, a source of pleasure to me to, to, to see that people are, are seeing different possibilities of, of, of bringing her out. And, and, uh, and so, um, I mean, this is a somewhat extreme example, but, but to have someone um, want to translate her into Esperanto, I think would have really gladdened Edith's heart. <laughs> um, uh, here is a poem from a different time of her life where she is heavily influenced by Friedrich Nietzsche. And uh, it, it is, as you will hear, very, very different from her early poetry, her early nature poetry, particularly. And um, so I want to read this one. It is called Power. And I must tell you that I was on a Zoom about a week ago with a poetry group reading this poem when my power went out. <laughs> and I said, Edith, what are you doing? Anyway, here goes power. I am the commander. Where are those who follow me? Even the greatest shield bearers are dreamers. Can no one read the fierce force of rapture in my eyes? Can no one grasp the meaning of my soft words to kindred spirits? I follow no law. I am a law unto myself. I am the human who seizes. Wow. Ben um, yeah, I'd also love to comment on this poem. So as Dina uh, mentioned, you know, heavily influenced by Nietzsche, this, this poem was heavily influenced and she was an avid reader of Nietzsche and she took a lot of his philosophies to heart. Um, some might even say a little too seriously. And I've written 
about her reception of Nietzsche. And I'd also like to point out that um, during Sudegren's writing at the time, a lot of critics, you know, they, they kind of mocked her for um, being so naive about um, her reading and interpretations of Nietzsche's philosophy, uh, mostly on account of her being a woman. And, uh, and so I and other scholars have looked at, you know, her reception of Nietzsche and, um, and especially his concept of the Ubermensch and with Nietzsche um, kind of sh contributing to the shift in our modern culture of thinking about societies that are no longer um, under the oppressive forces of Judeo-Christianity that we can go move beyond, again, these binaries of good and evil, for example, and that we, we can uh, create within ourselves autonomy and not limit ourselves to societal concepts of right and wrong, morality, all of that. And so Degran just took these ideas and created powerful, resounding poems as the one that Stina just, just wrote. Um, and uh, even though some of her, po her, her comments on this were um, quite, I wouldn't say extreme, but bold, um, I think uh, they were very valid. And um, I think uh, she, her reception of Nietzsche um, really draws out a lot of the, the interesting ways that he approached gender. He's um, was known as quite the misogynist, and and I'm not going to deny that he wasn't. Um, but he also with within that he paradoxically um, show um, uh, kind of conveyed a lot of power that, that women had, and Sudegran really tapped into that. Yeah. And that actually, um, we had another question about who were the poets and, you know, philosophers, I suppose, that Edith would have read and by whom was she influenced? And it sounds like she was influenced at various stages of her writing by different people. Can you talk maybe a little bit more about um, what those influences were and um, at what stage that they were influencing her? Uh, I think that's for you, Benjamin. Oh, okay. So as you mentioned, Walt Whitman, for example, yeah, she has had a Nietzsche um, later in her life. Um, I mentioned uh, her her posthumous poetry, um, The Land That Is Not, which was a shift. It was not so um, uh, heavily Nietzsche inspired. It was a more tender uh, um, representation or production and that really tapped into nature, but also some, some religious imagery. So she was also reading like the works of Rudolf Steiner, um, who uh, was also discussing some philosophy and um, some more esoteric uh, uh, beliefs, religious beliefs. Uh, so there's some of that. Um, she's often compared to um, uh, Emily Dickinson, some of her, her writing. Um, so there's that as well. Uh, are there others that you would like to mention, Stina? No, I think you're just about, just about did it, yeah. yeah. And then yeah. I also mentioned Heinrich Heine, so a lot of German uh, authors. Yeah. So. And yeah. going along with that, um, did she have any contacts um, with other modernist poets of her time? Like what was her involvement in that literary and um, modernist world um, during her lifetime? Well, it was... It was quite modest, but but b because of at uh, that point she was living in Raivola and uh, simply for practical reasons could not really be part of whatever was going on in the Finland Swedish literary world. But that did not mean that she wasn't reading widely, and uh, I don't think that either of us would want to give the impression that she was you know, a lonely, isolated person. She was not. Uh, she intellectually was very engaged in what was going on in, in, in her time. Um, in terms of, of, of meeting people, actually, um, she did make a couple of trips to Helsinki in order to meet, um, as she put it, I think, literary personalities or some quaint way of putting it. But, that did not go particularly well. They found her a little strange. She probably was nervous. And um, in fact, some people kind of made fun of her a little bit. But there were two uh, initially, and then more who were close to her. One was Hagar Olson, the uh, literary critic and writer. Um, who we mentioned before, and the other one was Elmar Dictonius, who, whose photograph 
by her, you saw in Benjamin's presentation, they um, had a kind of rivalry almost over who was closer to her and who was um, uh, who knew her best and so on. Um, and um, there, there is a lot of interpersonal um, kind of um, complications in 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 Seda Grant's uh, relationships to those two, and um, she herself contributed to that also. Um, but we would have to go uh, further than Finland and look out to to her other literary influences, people she didn't meet, but but you can speak a little bit more to that, maybe Benjamin. Um, I, yeah, I'd just like to add that she wrote several, uh, so many letters and you really get a sense of her personality from that. And I, and some of them have been translated. Um, I think I quoted from Sylvester Massarella. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then, it, and you get these exchanges um, among or between Södergran, Hagolsen and Zygtonius. It's fascinating, but you also, she wrote to many other authors, editors, and so as Tina said, she was um, not, um, there's often this projected image that she was so isolated, but her her words reached, reached many. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's why I was saying she would have been, she would have loved email. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, we have a couple of questions about um, translation. Um, so Stina, this is maybe for you, but also Benjamin, feel free to chime in. Um, what or how do you feel like, um, how much does a translator need to know about a culture to translate that work uh, correctly or, you know, um, in the, the way that's most true to the spirit of the original? Mm, good question. Yeah, I, I think I think the more the better. <laughs> um, I'm somewhat unusual in the sense that I've kind of migrated into a language from the original language, but most people translate the other way. But um, I've kind of adopted English as my primary language now, and and so. Um, that is the way it goes. Um, I think I think the more you know about the context, the more you know about the about the specific time that a poem was written, the better. Although I would you know caution against sort of coupling the the, the a particular poem to particular circumstances. It may seem sometimes that that you know poem has its origins in something concrete that happened uh, that time, but, but it may also not be that. It's mysterious the way poets work, and this is true for Dickinson, it's true for Sedagran, it's true for almost everybody. Influences can pop out into the, um, from the unconscious, from surprising places, and uh, so um, it's not always the biographical that has a connection to the poem. Beautifully said, yes. I love that. We don't have much time left, but I had one more poem that I wanted to read because- Yes, um, yes. Oh, it, and also before um, Benjamin and Sina, if you could also say, um, what your num like what your recommendation is for people to get started in um, learning more about Edith and reading more of her work if you have a book that you really think um, especially you know Stina I'm sure the ones you've translated um, but people are wondering you know how to how to uh, start reading her work so and there have absolutely been some pleas for one more poem so yes take it away okay Benjamin why don't you talk about that first if if people want to know more about her life where should they start yeah, so if you know Swedish, um, we've mentioned um, Agneta Rajka yeah. has uh, this, uh, wor this work that is um, also kind of, I would say, a, a, an amazing literary intervention into the biography. Of yeah, this, this is the one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Kampen om Edith. Yeah, highly recommended. 
And then if uh, for English, I would of course read Stina's um, uh, translations. Uh, that, that's where I started. And um, again, the first, the earlier edition is bilingual and then the second one uh, or the latest edition, excuse me, is, is just the English translations. Yeah. So shall we, shall we wrap up by my reading? Um, yes. yes, that sounds great. One of the most anthologized uh, poems comes from her late collection. And um, here, there actually seems to be a connection to something that she saw. And that brings out something I also wanted to mention. She was witness to the so-called Kronstadt rebellion, which is, Kronstadt is an island on the, as you, sail into St. Petersburg, it will be on your north. <clears throat> and it was the base for the Russian fleet and still is. And those soldiers during the revolution and Kronstadt were actually rebelling against the Bolsheviks and were siding with the whites or not quite, but at least they were rebelling against them. And the Bolsheviks crushed that rebellion in a brutal fashion. And Seragran in Teriyoki, and where she was on the Karelian Isthmus, could witness this. She could hear the bombardments and the fighting, and, and, and in fact, see some of the artillery and so on. And this speaks to her, her another side of her, which was her social consciousness and social involvement. She was someone who reached out and tried to help. And the Kronstadt refugees, which then, you know, numbered in the thousands, were passing by the Karelian Isthmus um, as a result of being thrown out of there. And some of it was very brutal, and there were dead people along the railroad tracks and so on. And I think this poem has its genesis on something that she saw there. It is called Nothing. Be calm, my child. There is nothing. And all is as you see it. The woods, the smoke, the vanishing rails. Somewhere far away in a distant land, there is a bluer sky and a wall with roses, or a palm tree, and a milder wind, and that is all. There is nothing more than the snow on a spruce's branch. There is nothing to kiss with warm lips, and with time all lips turn cool. But you say, my child, that your heart is mighty and that to live in vain is worse than to die? What did you want from death? Can't you feel the di 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 disgust oozing from his shroud and nothing is more repulsive than death by one's own hand? We should love life's long hours of illness and narrow years of longing as we do the brief moments when the desert blooms. Wow. <laughs> Thank you so much, both of you. This was incredibly um, just informative and um, uh, just really wonderful. And I want to thank both of you so much for lending your expertise on this Saturday morning. Um, and yeah, thank you so much. Do you have any final words you'd like to say or share? Before? I would just like to say that I think Benjamin... <laughs> Uh, has done such wonderful work to open up more vistas into Serda Grant's um, production. And I really appreciate uh, your work, Benjamin. Oh, and thank you so much for that. And then again, your translations, you know, they just <laughs> open worlds, really. So thank you so much. Oh, look.
Yes, I'm definitely going to go buy a Soto Ground book now. This was wonderful. Um, thank you both so much. Um, and if you'd like to learn more about FinFest, go to 2023.finfest.us. And that's where you can learn more about our festival and see some of the great um, program uh, presenters and speakers that we have on, on deck for us. And with that, um, I will say goodbye for the day. Uh, Benjamin and Stina, again, thank you so much. This was great. I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of the day. And we'll see you back in April for our next webinar. Thank you. Bye, all. Thank you.